Oh, you know, had those I, grand staircases to do your own, and like, like, I think I'm going to like yes. it here. Yeah, exactly. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I'm poor as a mouse. <laughs> it's like... We are back on the street you grew up on. Thank you for joining us. Today's guest is the brilliant and talented and amazing and beautiful actress, producer, star of American Crime Story Impeachment, my beloved Sarah Paulson. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Hello. So tell me about the street you grew up on. The name of the street, the city, the state. Give me the lowdown. I was born in Tampa, Florida. You were? And I was born in Tampa, Florida. And uh, we lived, the the house that I, I mean, I I said this to you when we were chatting about this via text about about doing this, that I moved so much as a child, Um, really never had a kind of home base. Like when I think about going home for the holidays or something, that isn't something that I connect to because my home was constantly changing, except for this one house, which was this, the, the first place that I lived, um, as Mm. a, as a young girl. I mean, I think my parents had their own home. I don't remember it. This was my grandparents' house. Um, Uh and the street was a a zeal street in Tampa, Florida. And it was a home that they built from the ground up, my grandparents, (gasps) Um, and my mom lived there since she was about 12 years old and it was the home that I spent that I have. I, I mean, I really can't stress to you enough. I have no memory of the home that my parents had. I only remember my sister and I talked about this uh, the other day because I told her I was doing this and we were sort of swapping stories about things that we remembered about the house. (gasps) It's still there. It's much changed on the inside. It's significantly updated, but all of these wild memories that we have, we were like, Oh my God. There's the closet. That's where we built the fort. That's where our grandmother used to like check the closet for the boogeyman every night before she tucked us in. Oh, <laughs> and we'd wow. Be like, what? The, boogie- the boogeyman's in the house, maybe? Uh, <laughs> so that's a whole other story. Oh, you didn't ask. Story, you didn't ask. I didn't ask. Bo- oh, I didn't ask she about the, boogie- the give, boogeyman. The boogeyman was introduced wow. to me. She gave me the boogeyman, um, which is a funny thing, thinking that she- I think she thought she was doing, um, you know, sure. right by us by letting us know she was checking the perimeter. That's right. But it was that sort of introduction of like something <laughs> scary could be in the house. Only <laughs> the like, people that, that, that. Yeah, exactly. But exactly. how do you spell Azeel? A Z E E L E. Of course, the house looked so tiny compared to what it felt like to my sister and I as children. Isn't right. that a bizarre thing when you Always. revisit a place when you were that you spent a lot of time in when you were barely four feet tall and you were just like, Oh my God, this is so tiny. I know. I, I, but sometimes when I go to my parents' house, I still expect the doorknob to be like at my eye line. <laughs> right. <at> eye line. <laughs> like I'm, and it doesn't live there. That's not what it looks like. It doesn't live there at all. It's so interesting. <laughs> so this was a house that your grandparents built. It was a house that my grandparents built and we spent so much time there. My mother was, a. Uh, uh, is, was a very young mother. She was 21 when she had me and 23 oh, when she had my wow. sister. Um, so, you know, back then, which doesn't seem like so long ago, except for I, when I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm going to be 47. What happened? <laughs> um, you know, at this time, and this was something that I think in general, life has sort of shape shifted this reality, but like, you know, my grandparents helped take care of us. This was mm. part of you know, how we were raised. And I think a a lot of people, we've sort of diverted from that because people are, you know, trying to do 3 million things at once and you think you can, and there's so much opportunity to do all that stuff that, you know, moving away from home is, is, um, you know, it's a real reality for a lot of people. But, Mm. but for that time when we were, when we were really young, I mean, my, my grandparents, I have more memories of eating dinner with my grandparents than I do with my mother. Tell me more about the house. Like, what were the memories that came up for you and your sister? Oh, gosh. I mean, there was a banister that that sort of overlooked the foyer, even though we never came in the house that way. We always entered the house through the garage. Uh-huh. My grandmother had, um, grandparents had this incredible blue Oldsmobile station wagon. Oh. And you would enter the house um, from the garage, even though the front the front of the house had this kind of grand entrance that mm-hmm. I'm sure when they built was this, you know. Um, but I don't remember ever walking into it from that right. side. So you would that like was go like up fancy space yeah. for visitors. It was like the fancy space for mm-hmm. visitors. And I guess mm-hmm. if you weren't a family member, you might come in that way. Right. If you came to the house. Right. But if you lived there, 
you came in mm-hmm. through the garage mm-hmm. and that's how it was. Um, but I just, you know, my sister and I were talking about these, these wild memories of my, my uncle, my mother's brother, like hanging us by our feet over the banister. <laughs> and my grandmother, like John, you know, my, my grandmother was born in Mobile, Alabama. And my mother was born in Tuscaloosa. She just was so distressed by the idea of you know, our five-year-old me and three-year-old me and my sister being hung, you know, my, my, bro- my uncle is, you know, six foot four is huge. Oh my um, goodness. And he was still living at home because my mother and, and brother were about eight years apart. So she mm. was already sort of, you know, down the street with kids, even though we were there all the time, but John was still living at home. So there was a lot of terrorizing from this, you know, <laughs> young adult uh, with these little, you know, urchins that were living in the house. We built forts. We had yes. so many cats all the time. And, cats. um, we had so many cats. There's so many pictures I have of me, like holding a cat, like, you know, thinking I'm holding it sweetly, but it's like around the neck. <laughs> it's struggling. The head and it's just struggling. <laughs> um, you know, and my sister and I, we talked all the time about like how that house just felt like an, like a, a complete safe haven for us. Mm. And, and she too has very, very few memories of, of, homes outside of that experience. We remembered, we were just sort of like calling out things we remember. And I was like, our room was to the, up the stairs. And we said at the same time to the left. And we, I was like, yeah, to the left. And Daisy and Poppy, that's what we called our, our grandparents or still do, um, were over to the right. And then the sitting room was in the, it just, we just remember it exactly. Um, I mean, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but I can remember everything about this house. What about smells? I do remember how it smelled. It sort of smelled of my grandmother's perfume and hairspray and the smell of a kind of Velcro roller, which she wore <laughs> a lot. She would always like have, she was one of those people who would have like a, she would set, it wasn't even a Velcro, what was, it might have been a Velcro roller. It wasn't the pink kind that clipped. It uh-huh. was the kind that, you know. Yeah, yeah, they is, just I stay in today. place because they you hook just stay in hair. place. You just yeah. hook it, lock it down mm-hmm. and it stays. But I remember that. And I remember my grandfather's cologne was a big part of, um, and we were big, big, big churchgoers. So it was a big part of our time there was, you know, Sunday school, driving Mm. from their house to Sunday school. My grandfather would sing a song called Sunday School is Over and We Are Going Home when we were (laughs) done. And my sister and I can still sing all the lyrics to it to this day. I remember the feeling of being in that house and Mm. Christmas in that house. And it's, it's, you know, my, my sister and I were looking at these pictures, um, online today about, uh, the house as it was, as it looks today. And we saw the fireplace where my father proposed to my mother. There's a picture of him proposing to her in this house. It's where I was conceived. Oh my goodness. It's that literally the street, literally like the the, the story (laughs) of the beginning of me in every way. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What was the food like in there? My grandmother, I remember, uh, it's, what's funny is I remember a lot of like green beans with almonds. Like oh, a lot of that's green beans so with almonds. Sweet. And I don't know if that was an effort to be sort of like fancy or whether yes. that was just, I remember the dishes there was, and my grandmother was very big on um, manners. You know, my mother had a cotillion. Mm. There was a full, you know, oh. it was a real sort of Southern story there. Yes. Yes. Um, and it was a real, my grandmother was, there was a thing about Miss Manners and, you know, pretending that they were at the table with us, this interesting thing of imagination that my grandmother was sort of instilling uh, manners in my sister and myself, but but it was done in this imaginative way that Miss Manners was watching and that we wanted to make sure to napkin in the lap and being part of the clean the plate club. And my grandfather would say he was president of the clean the plate club for a long time. And it was a way of like encouraging us to clean our plates and eat our food and wash our dishes and all these things. It was if there was some like omnipresent um, imaginary person that was sort of helping to keep us in line in a way that we wanted to please my sister and myself. Oh, that's so, so fascinating. Yeah. Because it it's the combination really... of Miss Manners and the boogeyman, right? That they, and exactly. imagination kind of held both ends that's of right. the behavior that's right. spectrum. So, yeah, that's, it's true. Was imaginative play a big part of your life in that house and sort of with your sister? Were, were you beginning to develop your incredible imaginative skill? I think so. I mean, my sister and I, we would, I mean, this was, you know, the beginning of my sort of um, bossing everybody around and deciding how everything should be. Should be. And because I am the oldest. The producer um, was I, born. My, the producer was born. And, and um, yeah, we played, we played there 
it was like, it's like where I discovered Sesame Street. And it was, I remember, you know, hearing the music for Sesame Street and bouncing down the stairs from my room to come and plop on the couch and that couch where I was um, in May. Um, on the couch? The couch on the couch. <laughs> why not a bedroom? I don't know. And I why do you mother, know that? Why do you know this that is the thing? The I am of the generation. I mean, I don't know my mother, my mother being a young mother. I mean, I think part of this sort of like the generation of the overshare, you know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, just sort of like a almost, you know, because her parents are and were quite conservative, both mm. politically and religious. Uh, we, mm. and my mother was sort of this born in 1952 and coming of age in the mid sixties and just sort of like, no, I'm not doing any of this. And, yes. and fully telling me, you know, yeah, you were, that's what you were. And I remember being like, oh, well, <laughs> I don't really know what that means, but now I just feel creeped out. <laughs> and I think I remember I don't like, switching sit to my there. grandfather. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I think I remember switching to my grandfather's lazy boy. That was also <laughs> over there directly towards the television. I mean, I have a picture of my grandmother holding me in that house in that lazy boy when mm. I just had come home from the hospital. So I really oh. spent, there's pictures of me singing, um, the sun will come out tomorrow, which, you know, I'm not a singer, but it was the beginning of my, I mean, when I think about making my family do this, where I'd make them all sit down and I would perform for them. You would just perform. Oh, I would be like, everybody sit. I make my mother put you know, little ribbons and, you know, full glam hair and makeup prior yes. to my, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. pre-union, and, you yeah. know, Yes. Yeah. Put on my special Sunday church dress and I would sing without any skill, Carrie. I mean, mm. zero. Doesn't singing matter. Skill. But all it heart. doesn't matter. But there was some part of it, you know, that was like, and they all obliged. They all, you know, sat down and, and they talk about it now as if that was the beginning of, you know, it's the bathroom I did all my Prell commercials in as I was practicing <laughs> my, my, my Prell commercials. I do, my sister remembers like looking up at me and like, they being like, Prell. Oh my goodness. I mean, just wackadoo actress right from the get. Oh, I love it. Okay. So you, you really have just such an extraordinary ability to transform into other human beings. I mean, I'm, we happen to be recording this on a Tuesday, which is like a national holiday in my house because impeachment <laughs> comes on tonight. Like my kids, my seven-year-old is like, today's impeachment day. I'm like, I know. I'm oh so glad God. you know, because you're going so to bed cute. early. Um, <laughs> and um, I wonder, like the performing, did it have a transformative element? Was it about kind of showmanship or was it about becoming somebody else? Like when did, when did that happen? That desire to disappear into a character? I feel like that was always the impetus. impetus. That was always mm. the, yeah, it was always the, I don't know about you, but anytime I can do something when I look in the mirror and I don't see myself, I feel so liberated from an mm. acting standpoint, liberated, mm. truly. Yes. Like, yeah. and I don't know how much of that has to do with whatever buying into a sort of societal uh, story about beauty and attractiveness and rightness of one's face and body that, that I have sort of struggled with, like how to, you know, so often in the beginning of my career, it was like, I would change my hair color with the, you know, the wind, whoever the, the person was that was having the most success in that moment was just constantly uh. trying to shift and be what I thought was desirable. desirable. You know? Yeah. 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 And, Likeable, and hireable. So, totally. And so much of that stuff got ingrained in my head so early on. Uh, when I first started that, and, and I wasn't working. So I kept feeling like there's something wrong with me mm. when later on, I just sort of thought, oh, it took me a minute to be me in my working environment mm. in order to have some of that stuff. It was like a, a funny moment when I sort of started to shed the mm. idea that it had to be connected to some right kind of beauty or yes. some expected form of uh, attractiveness or, you know, desirability that kind of thing when I let go of some of that is when I felt like some of my work became something that I was more proud of or mm. felt more reflective of at least what I was wanting and hoping to do. So, I mean, as a kid, I think I definitely remember like playing characters. I mean, even in this house, like my, my grandmother's friends and doing voices and things. And, and my grandmother sort of who I think had fancied herself at one point wanting to be an actress you know, ah. so there's this sort of interesting, and and I remember talking about her to her when I was 
first starting out. And I said, but why didn't you do it? And she just said she was too afraid. Mm. She was too scared to try. Um, so I oh. think I always had like that wonderful audience in my grandparents um, and in that house, which had a lot of space to make stages. And there were like, st- <laughs> there were like, you know, stair landings where, you know, I could make a grand entrance. Um, and my oh. sister, of course, being a really willing participant because she was younger and I think looked up to me and I could tell her what to do when she would do it. And <laughs> <laughs> those were the days because those days, those days are no more. She tells me what to do now. <laughs> I love the, um, the threads that start to appear. Like when you said that your grandmother was afraid, mm-hmm. I just thought, oh, what a gift she was giving you every night with the mm-hmm. boogeyman, right? That mm-hmm. she was sure mm-hmm. it was so important to her to make you brave and to know that she right. was now brave. It's just That's like, right. That's right. And that she could protect me. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. To give you something she couldn't even give herself in a way. Correct. That's right. Um, Were you big into watching television and films when you were in that house? Oh, really? Oh, yes. What were your favorites? This is, I think, this, well, it was, I mean, I remember very clearly Sesame Street. And what was the other one? Um, One, two, three, Contact. Was that a show? Uh Uh-huh. It was. Uh Mm Uh-huh. I watched a lot of that. But the shift that happened in terms of like, oh, the acting thing happened was when I saw Annie, when I saw Annie, which was a movie that I did not see at home, but I saw in the theater, but then came home to that house and was right. just like, you oh, know, you had those I, grand staircases to do staircases your own, and like, like, I think I'm going to like yes. it here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm poor as a mouse. <laughs> it's like, I'm richer than Midas, you know. What no, part I mean, did I you just, want to play Annie? Is that, was that the part you I wanted, wanted to play? I wanted to play Annie. And yes, I wanted to play Annie. And it was really the first time I understood that what we were watching was not real. And it was, I remember just sort of stopping my brain and, and really jump starting the performances in the house that had to happen. Really? And my sister had to be, you know, Molly. My sister, was it Molly? I think it was Molly who was the little. Oh my the goodness. Orphan. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, so I would make. <laughs> I would make Elizabeth be Molly and all the other orphans. But I wanted to be Miss Hannigan, too, if I'm honest. That's who I played all the... I mean, I my mother was like, why is my child pretending to be drunk all the time? <laughs> because I just <laughs> wanted to be Miss Hannigan. You're just like, who doesn't want to be Miss Hannigan? She I mean, in that performance. Oh, and I wanted Carol to be Burnett. Anne Ranking, too. I wanted to be... I mean, there's everything about the whole thing was just so extraordinary to me. But it was the first time that I understood that that was a profession mm, that was something mm-hmm. you could do and that they were creating a world for us to mm. dive in and live in. And it was just like this wild, like mind blowing awareness of something I had never considered before. Who else? Can you tell me just a little bit about the street Azil? Like what were, were there a lot of houses? Were there other families with kids? My sister was always very brave one. She would, no matter what neighborhood we were living in, my sister would like, bing bong. Hi, we live here. Can we? And I'd be like behind, behind the, waiting to see if it was okay to come out. She's so much braver than I am in, in every single way. Um, but we, we did, we played with the kids across the street and they also like, there was a lot of food being shared from houses. Mm. And, and we had this, we had this backyard um, where all the dogs and the cats and all that sort of stuff was, was happening in the backyard a lot. And, but, and it was, it was neighborhoody. And and I think my mother and father's house was not far away. I just don't Mm -hmm. remember a damn thing about it. We were (laughs) always, I mean, there's a picture, man. Oh, I wish I could find it. I have it somewhere of the day we left Azeal street. Mm. My mom, my parents were divorced and my mother was taking us to New York. Mm. And it's a picture of my grandparents my father, me, my sister, and my mother's obviously taking the picture. And it was the last time we were there in a really regular, regular way. If you could go back and say something to that little girl in that picture, mm-hmm. who's going to leave Azeal Street, what mm-hmm. would you say to her? Would you have advice for her? Or... I probably now would say... I know you really didn't want to leave here, but you had probably one of the coolest, bravest mothers who was pursuing something for herself, for her own happiness that led me ultimately to mine. 
she was a real free spirit and was mm. just, and as I said, really young. So by the time mm. I was in fourth grade, how old are you in the fourth grade? 10, nine, 10? Uh, yes. Yeah. Nine. My mother was 32, 30, wow. 31. Mm. So, you know, if my mother had never moved to New York, I would be lucky if I were doing, you know, if I were playing Snow White at the Disneyland uh, and that would be a great freaking job and I'd be super yeah. happy to have it. I'd love to have it now. I bet it would be really fun. <laughs> but I'm just saying like my, the, the possibility, I don't mm. know if I ever would have dreamed mm -hmm. as big as I began to dream because more uh, possibilities were in front of me, yes. you know, because of what my mother decided to do for my mother. And it was heartbreaking to leave the, the, the bosom of that home, but it ultimately was the beginning of a road somewhere I never could have imagined ever. Mm. As a mom, I so appreciate what you just shared, you know, because it's so important to, to not lose yourself, to like still pursue your life and to trust that, that, that that's actually teaching your children to do yeah. the same for themselves. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to remember it's, I that. I bet it's really hard. I, I yeah. bet it's really, really hard, but I do I also think they see. Yes. They see, I know I did with my mom that it was like I I saw that she was pursuing something. Yeah. That she mattered to and herself. Was, and that she mattered to herself it's and that big that deal. made me mm -hmm. that made me capable of sort of investing in myself and yes. and not even in a, an uber conscious way it was just the choices I was making were ones that sort of felt confident even if mm -hmm. they weren't. But it was because the mirror I had was a woman who uh, needed for her own survival to move away from from there and, and pursue her own dreams. And Ugh. I love that you chose Azeal Street because I know it felt like, oh, I'm not sure what street to talk about because I didn't grow mm -hmm. up necessarily in that. But but when I hear you talk about it, it's like, boy, the the exodus from that house really was the right. impetus for your growing up. It's just right. so beautiful. So it's sort of interesting too to think about how like sometimes the place you leave mm -hmm. might be just as imprinting mm -hmm. as the place you've lived for your entire life yeah you know? that's right um <laughs> so if is there anything that you would like to now bring into your life from a zeal street as you've been thinking about it do you feel like there's anything you you want to bring forward Something that we did a lot was we had these like, I'm going to say formal dinners, but it was formal because it was, it was um, almost scheduled. It was like mm. what we did. And when I lived mm -hmm. with my mother, you know, m for the rest of my life, we never had a formal dinner. And by formal, I mean, just sitting down at a certain time. Mm. And, and I would love to bring a kind of more habitual, um, story into mealtime because mm. I do feel, um, you know, so much of what we we do is like, you know, you're eating on the fly while you're going here and you're changing and you've got yes. 20 minutes and screw it. I'm not even going to take the lunch break. Let's just keep, you know, yep. all of those things that there is a kind of, um, you know, I loved talking to my grandparents at dinner and we mm. would have the kitchen table dinner that was when it was just us. And then the dining room dinner when there was, you know, extended family over. And it was so fun to get dressed up and, and sit down and show them that I could put my napkin in my lap and sort of impress the family with the things I've been taught by my grandmother, mm. who I so adore and who is just, I really think of as being a person who really, my sister and I both is really raised us and they consider us their third and fourth children. They always tell us not really our grandchildren, but their third and fourth children. And so I would love the idea of, of bringing in a more sort of structured meal time mm. because it was the invention of Mrs. Miss Manners and, mm. you know, the clean the plate club thing. And this sort of, um, you know, it was just very warm feeling for me. Um, okay. So my final question is, you know, there's this thing, there's this idea that your sexy alter ego name is your, the name of your first pet and the street you grew up on. So I know it's a yes. zeal, but you've been uh -huh. talking about a lot of animals. So I don't know if you, <laughs> yeah. can, if you can identify the first pet. Okay. Oh, I have a first pet for okay. sure. Okay. Her name was Polly. <laughs> so my name is Polly Azeal. That's hot. It's kind of hot. It's yeah. kind of hot. Because, because it, 
I think the names that are the best are the not like overt, yes. like sexy time Agreed. name, but it's Agreed. actually kind of sex. Like who's named po- like Polly yeah. Platt? There's like very few great Pollys, but Polly, Polly Azeal. This was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. This was so I great. Adore you. I just adore you more. I really do. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you so much for tuning in. I loved that interview with Sarah. I love that Sarah really hit on the idea that the street you grew up on isn't necessarily the street that you lived on at any particular age. It doesn't have to be the street you were born on. It's really just the place that felt like home, the place that had the most tremendous impact on your growing up. So thank you, Sarah, for taking us to Azeal Street. Thank you all for watching. Again, we want to know who you want to hear from. We want to know what streets you want to travel to. So make sure you let us know in the comments. Make sure that you like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so we can tell you when we have exciting things going on. But I'm just so grateful that you tuned in. I'm so grateful to have these opportunities to be in conversation with people that I love about the places they love. So thank you for joining us and I'll see you soon.